Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. We all need as much help as we can get when it comes to our board exam tips, time management hacks, and how to get into the residency of our choice. Today, Dr. Wendell Cole, author of the Medical School Survival Kit, will give us his sage advice that allowed him to study smarter, save time, and have a healthy social life during medical school. Dr. Cole is an orthopedic surgeon at Tulane, has been a host on a number of episodes of other podcasts such as Inside the Boards and Docs Outside the Box, and hosts his very own podcast, Convos with Cole. Dr. Cole, I'm really delighted to have you on the show today. Oh, man, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm always supportive of when people are trying to, or when people not trying to, when people are actually doing things that, that are a little bit outside the box, per se. You know, shout out to need, Dr. Nee Darko. <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm always supportive <laughs> and I'm always down to help and, you know, however I can be of service, I am here to do so. Awesome. Yeah, and he's a great guy. And ironically, as we were discussing before the uh, present record here, I actually heard about you and your book initially from Inside the Boards podcast with Patrick yeah. Beeman. So we've got like a, a small little got a circle, circle going yeah, on here. Got a whole circle. We'll all <laughs> hang out, sing Kumbaya together. It'll be cool. <laughs> <laughs> who's drums? Who's guitar? <laughs> uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be a good time. <laughs> so... With everything that you've already accomplished, and I'm assuming many more things to come, what are some of the uh, ways you've been able to accomplish everything with such a, a hectic schedule and doing some of this during med school, doing it during residency? Just kind of how have you done what you've done? Well, you know, kind of what, what we were talking about before we clicked record and, and just doing it, you know, now, you know, a lot of people love to wait and say, hey, we'll wait till we're, we're all done with, I'm done with residency or RK, I'll wait till I'm done with med school or I'll wait till this, you know, then I'll have more time to do things. And you know, it's always like a delaying game. It's procrastination, procrastinating, procrastinating, and you never get things done. So I've always just found a way to do things just by doing them now, you know, and figuring out a way to, to do it. Because in med school, you don't realize it in med school, but you have a lot more time than you, than you think, um, especially now being in residency and, and taking call and, and working a bunch. You realize like, how much more time you had in med school when it didn't seem like that. And then when you're in med school, you realize how much more time you had in undergrad. So it's always, it's always like another level of things. But, you know, I've just kind of been able to do more or, you know, I, I figured out the 80-20 rule, right? There's a, there's a rule that says kind of 80% of your productivity is done by 20% of your activities. So if you figure out those 20% of things that you're doing that's giving you 80% of the output, you can focus in on those 20% of things instead of, doing this 100% and only being somewhat effective, be effective in the things that you do. You know, you may not do a lot, but the things that you do do, be very effective in it and just focus on that one thing, you know. Definitely. I love the Pareto rule, 80-20 yeah. rule. It's the Pareto principle, I should say. Yeah, it's, it's everywhere now. And I wish I had really focused on that more during medical school. I probably could have had a lot more time. Instead, uh, I probably more accurately was depicted by, was it Parkinson's Law? where every waking second gets filled with something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't heard that law. Uh, I got to look that up. I haven't heard that one. I heard the Pareto, but I haven't heard the Parkinson's one. Or I, I probably have heard it, but I probably didn't. Re- no, with the name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's something along the lines of whatever time you allot to something, you'll find some way to fill it. So like, you need to set aside some time for leisure and, and breaks and stuff like oh, that, because yeah. otherwise you'll study all the time. Yeah, you'll go crazy. <laughs> crazy. And I, you know, I, I also came into medical school or, you know, came into residency, you know, all the things I came into, I had the mindset of like, I'm going to do the best I can in the allotted time I'm doing that, you know, my, so basically saying like my whole life is not consistent of just medical school or just residency, you know, um, my goal is to be the best doctor that I can be and, and get the best training that I can. And when I'm there, there's nothing else going on but that. But as soon as I'm outside of there, Life goes on. There are other things, and you know, there are other things that keep you balanced in life that you that you have to remember to to do, or or else you kind of just get sucked into the system and you just kind of just become a robot and you kind of forget um, a lot of the things that that you like to do that are outside of medicine. 
Yeah, I can't think of anything I liked to do during my first few years of medical school because I was so involved in in just that and focusing on that. Yeah. So good to take some breaks. And I'm assuming that a lot of this has to do with why you decided to write your book, right? Right. Yeah. So, you know, the book came about because I was, again, I did a lot during med school, right? You know, like I started med school and I had like a startup business I was I was running or, you know, I was in the process of, of launching. And then during med school, I was part of this other, it's called Network Marketing Company. And another classmate and I started like a real estate investment company and started doing some real estate investments and traveled a bunch. And everybody, if you didn't see me in the classroom, like if you weren't in an actual med school, like one of my classmates, nobody else believed I was in med school because I was doing like all these other things. You're like, there's no way you're in med school. You're traveling right now. Like you're here. I just saw you over there. Like there's no way you're, you're in medical school right now. And, you know, nobody would believe it. Not nobody would believe it, but they were like, dude, how are you doing all this while you're still in med school? And, you know, again, it's just that Pareto rule. I was just trying to figure out, I teased apart the 20% of things that made my productivity. And then I wanted just to put them all in a book. Because another thing I also realized is that some of the things I wish I would have learned a lot earlier would have saved me a lot more time. And I'm always a person that tries to think of, well, if it could save me a lot more time, I'm sure it could save somebody else a lot more time too. So that's, you know, one of the big reasons why I decided to write the book and put it out there. So far, it's gotten great reviews. It's gotten um, a lot of good feedback. I've gotten messages from a bunch of people saying, you know, it's helped them with their school. Their grades are going up. So I think it's it's good for me. Um, I think it's good for most people and it's helping people out, which is kind of the most important thing. Awesome. I Yeah, I read about your real estate group and I was really surprised you could fit all of that in and actually don't talk too much about the things you wish you did differently because that's how we end the episode usually. Yeah. So we'll come back around to that. Sure. I did want to ask, and yeah, I was kind of thinking that some of the 80-20 rule, it's probably a little bit individualized. So it's, I'm assuming, a little difficult to write something that's all-encompassing that everyone can optimize themselves from. But at the same time, a lot of the same principles teach right. them the principles and they can make it themselves. Exactly. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, I've seen some really good things about the book and I really wish I had read it beforehand i got so swamped with like 50 other ones that i didn't get a chance to this time i usually do better research but uh right luckily you no, were available fine. pretty quickly this time <laughs> yeah no that's fine what are some strategies that you could actually recommend for students obviously we know the general principle of the 80 20 rule but maybe do you have an example that you can give yeah there you know there are a lot of if you go on research out there there are like a bunch of different study techniques and different ways of memorizing things and different things with association. But I like to kind of just take it back to the, to the basics and, you know, repetition and repetition is key, you know, so uh, repetition over long periods of time. So me, I'm, I like to kind of consider myself the lazy studier, right? I don't, I would rather study 15 minutes a day for five days and study what 75 minutes in one day. So that's how, that's kind of how I think about it. And then every time you see a piece of information, every time you see it over and over again, it kind of solidifies and transitions from that short-term memory to like the medium term and then the long-term memory. So one of the ways that how I organized studying, um, I'll give you kind of an example schedule that I had. You know, So for example, if you're going over something in class tomorrow, today you take 15 minutes and you just kind of just do a broad overview. You know, you might look at a YouTube video, you know, something passive, something not too much. You know, you might just read something um, over the topic that takes nothing but 10 or 15 minutes. Then, so that's the first time you're going through the topic. The second time you're going through the topic is when you're in actual class, because now you've seen the topic for the past 15 or so. You've seen, you, you looked at the broad overview, so now you know what it's talking about. So now, you can better pay attention and kind of ask more informed questions. That's one of the things that we not always take for granted, but we don't necessarily do in class. You know, we may be on like social media, Instagram and Facebook while we're in class versus actually paying attention and, and trying to get the most out of the lecture. Cause that's what they're there for. You know, your professors are there to teach you. So if you actually take that class time and use it as study time, that's less work that you have to do outside of medical school. That's like, that's, a, that should be like another hour of studying right there while you're in the classroom. Right. So then that'll be the second time you go over the information. And later on that evening, say you go over the same thing for 
maybe 15, 30 minutes, let's say about, let's say 45 minutes, because that's kind of what I put in, in the book. So say you go over for 45 minutes. So now within it, 24 hours, you've seen the same information three different times and you've understood it at three different levels. One was on a superficial level, one was a little bit more in depth, and then one was kind of getting into the details later on that evening when you looked at it. So then the next day, before you study um, everything that you learned that day, you take 15 minutes to look over the information that you learned yesterday, right? So then that'll be your fourth pass with information. And then the day after that, say you may take 10 minutes or so to go through it because now you've seen it a couple of times, you recognize um, different, like you, you remember it, so it doesn't take you as long to get through it. And it's, and it's that continuous, uh, continuous review at the beginning of each study session which will help you remember the information longer for a longer period of time too. Cause you know, sometimes at some um, different schools at the end of the year, there might be a board exam and you're like, Oh man, if you just sat there and you crammed for the exam, all that went in short term memory. And then by the time that you have to take your board exam, it's, it's all out of it. But if for t- guilty, exactly. Right. So, so if for two <laughs> weeks you sat and you learned it and you and you repeated it in your head for a whole two weeks in a row before you took your initial exam by the time it's to you're ready to take your you know your board exam on that topic it'll be easier for you to just kind of go back and review so that's just one of that's just one of like many ways that you can study more efficiently and better and then another thing is when you're studying like getting off of the phone you know at first i had a little trouble with that you know i'd realize that I'd be studying for an hour, but then like, you know, like 10 minutes into it, I'd be watching a YouTube video or I'd like be checking Facebook and I'd be responding to some text messages from friends or so. So I was studying, but I wasn't really studying. And I realized I got, um, I wasn't getting much done in that hour of of so-called studying, but I mean, technically I was kind of studying versus you know, no distractions, getting everything else out the way. I realized I got more done in 25 minutes going that way versus an hour kind of having my things spread out and multitasking. I think like contrary to popular belief, um, there are some times where multitasking is not the best thing to do. And I think that's kind of one studying. I know I've been ra- yeah, I, I know I've been ranting for like five minutes. So go ahead. <laughs> no, good. It's good. Very useful information. I know the audience is going to get some good good information today. Speaking of good information today, I'd like to take a second to mention today's sponsor, Common Bond. Common Bond is excited to announce a new in-school medical loan specifically designed for med students. The loan was designed to save medical students thousands of dollars versus the federal grad plus loan and comes with the protections like flexible payments and forbearance, all without the need for a cosigner. While many students are familiar with the Federal Grad Plus loan, what most don't realize is that the federal government offers the same interest rate to all graduate students, regardless of the student's course of study or future earnings potential. The current Federal Grad Plus loan carries a 7.6% interest rate and 4.25% origination fee. Medical students are not your average student. So a one-size-fits-all loan didn't seem right. Common Bond now gives more options for medical student loan repayments. And now, back to the show. No, I was going to just agree. Like, I didn't realize how inefficient some of my study sessions were until I started looking into proper study sessions and actually monitoring and assessing my usual schedule and then how I'm doing it now and how much quicker I'd get through some material and the difference in the amount of time we probably waste eighty percent of the time we're studying yeah. by being distracted and multitasking and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, really good to hear that you've like, noticed a big change yeah. in just a couple of simple changes in your study patterns. Exactly. And then another thing is, you know, after that third day of you going through the information, teach it to somebody else because then once you can process it in your head and you've learned to you know process the information and then now you're teaching somebody else that information. Number one, it tests to see if you really know what you're, what you're talking about, to see if you really know the subject. And then number two, it helps solidify it some, even more because you have to know what you're talking about in order to teach somebody else. So, you know, if you're studying with a group of people, um, you know, you have to go there and go through in depth everything about that subject. You know, no notes. Well, you try to do it for no notes at first, but that's another one of the ways where you jog your memory and you have to think about it and, and process it and, and 
help somebody else understand it. And that'll solidify it in your head even quicker. Plus, you're a surgeon. Isn't that like the surgeon's motto? See one, do one, teach one? So. <laughs> that's it. No, that's literally exactly what it is. Yeah. So like when I have interns coming up in the next couple of months, like I will, I will teach you. You know, because it's coming to the time where I'm going to have interns and then we're going to have to teach them. So you know you're proficient in it if you can teach somebody else and then they grasp the concept. You know, you, you know you're less uh, efficient if you're having trouble teaching somebody else or you may not know all the steps and whatever procedure it may be. So that's a good way to make sure that you know what you're talking about and that you can show somebody else how to do whatever you're doing or learn how to do whatever you're trying to learn effectively. So true. I noticed all the gaps in my uh, microbiology knowledge when I started trying to make my micro course. I'm like, geez, do I really know that? Or do I just think I know that I had to double check everything and uh, it took so long to hire a fact checker next time. But Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> like, you don't realize. Like, you, you don't realize it. Like, you think you know it all. You're like, oh, yeah, I know that subject. I don't need to look over it. And then you try to explain it. You're like, man, maybe I don't know this. Yep. It's, it's that uh, illusion of competence or illusion of knowledge. One of those two. I always get it mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> so with the uh, space repetition, I like to get everyone's different viewpoints on this. And everyone seems to have a slightly different way they do it. Like, I don't know if I heard this or I created it, but I have this rule, a one one three one one rule, where within an hour, within a day, within three days, which is the one that messes up the straight ones within a week and then within a month. So you get a lot of repetitions, but it's, it gradually increases the repetitions and just kind of an easy way to remember it. So like you're saying, you go over the material within an hour from the time that you're going to learn it. Like what, what exactly do you mean? I guess between the one, one, three, like you mean, that's when you go, that's when you look at it again. So for instance, if I read something in a book or watch a video lecture, then often I'll screenshot it and add it to my notes. And then I'll review it right there as I'm adding it to like Anki or something like that. That'll be my first review. And that's within an hour generally. And then it'll, I have the Anki set up to kind of bring it back the next day. And then I'll bring it back in a few days after that one. Assuming oh, I, I get it right. If I don't, then it's more frequent. And yeah, it just kind of increases it in a, a memorable pattern that I find easy to remember. But also it, uh, I don't know, it seems to be one that if you were doing a manual deck, instead of like an automated one like Anki, it would be easy for you to keep track of that way. Mm, right. Yeah, no, I'm, see, again, I'm just a lazy studier, man. And I'd, I'd rather like just look at it every day for a little bit of time than spend more time on one day, and, you know, versus the other. You know, I'd rather just, I'm a proponent for just spending small amounts of time on it every single day. That way you're, you're still seeing it every day. And it's just more, you know, repetition as a father of learning. Yeah, I guess I just feel like I'd probably get overburdened if I'm adding new stuff and doing all the old stuff right. every day, which is like my spacing it out can make it a little better for further back. I don't well, know. I, it's good to see everyone's different like opinions. Well, on I it. think it differs, you know, maybe if like, if you were talking about like step one studying, then, you know, going over every single day's material may not be as effective versus like, you know, on Monday I'm going over cardiology and then Tuesday I'll go over this other this other, um, you know, I'll go over renal or something. So I think there's, there are different instances where different types of study techniques will be, you know, a little bit better than the other. Um, so, you know, yeah, like st studying for step one or, or step two is a little bit different than, you know, your class, your classroom test, you know, your classroom farm uh, antibiotic test. It's a little bit different than that. Uh, we said step one and the hairs <laughs> on my arm rose. Came <laughs> back memory is PTSD. Oh, yeah. Dark totally. rooms and just, just studying. Man, I'm so glad it's over with. Yeah. Oh, God, that year sucked, man. So then what would you be able to advise on for maybe a way students can self-assess if they're actually implementing the strategies properly? I am a big proponent of questions. Uh, I think questions test your knowledge. I think questions let you know if you actually know the subject or not. And then sometimes I'm actually a proponent of doing questions before you read the material. And the reason I say that is because if you do the questions before you read the material, you kind of, even though you'll get many of them wrong, right? So this is another thing mm -hmm. how, I, how I approach different sections. So say in class, I knew we were going to go do the cardiology section for the next couple of weeks. In UWorld or whatever question bank you use, 
um, I did, I like, I try to look through a good amount of the questions. Now, I did very bad, poorly, because I've never seen the subject or I never knew anything about it. But I looked at it, I looked at how they worded the questions and I read the, the uh, explanation. So now when I'm learning the material or when I'm learning it, I guess for the second time or, you know, actually doing the lecture and reading the book or watching the videos or whatever it is, now I know how to learn the information because I've seen the question. So I know how they'll ask the question, like, instead of what's something, you know, like step one, or like, for example, like, what's that? Cardi- cardiac tamponade. Oh man, cardiac tamponade. I don't know the last time I looked at that. <laughs> like you were reading the book, you know, that has, um, what is it? Bex triad of hypotension and whatever else is in there. And, you know, you read it in the book versus if you read the question beforehand, they'll say, hey, this person is coming in with shortness of breath uh, every time they muffled take a, heart sounds. Exactly. Muffled heart sounds. <laughs> like what is it? every time they take a breath or blood pressure decreases by or drops by, et cetera. So you know how they're going to phrase the, the, the stem or how they're going to uh, approach this question. So, you know, like this is how they're going to phrase this information that I have to learn here on cardiac tamponade. So then when you're reading it in the book, you'll say, okay, they're not going to say pulses paradoxes. They're going to, they're going to tell me that the blood pressure is dropping 10 or 20 millimeters of mercury when the person inspires or whatever it may be. So I'm, I'm a proponent of doing questions uh, and doing questions often because that, again, is another way of repetition and another way of making sure that you know the information. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, a lot of the accelerated learning type of material that I've seen really recommends reading all the end of chapter questions first because it'll, if nothing else, prime you for the important parts you're about to read about. Yeah. So maybe you world would be a little bit extreme for some students <laughs> if you're just starting off, like yeah. in your first year especially. But I can definitely see using that tactic and just seeing what the writers think are the important topics yeah. to, to take away before reading everything. You know, even if it's like a basic anatomy, um, basic anatomy book, you know, that you're learning in first year, like you may look and you may look and see like, oh, this is an axillary nerve. You know, you're like, oh, that's the axillary or the radial nerve. And you go to the question like, oh, this patient uh, has problems extending their wrist what nerve is, or, or they'll be like, oh, this nerve lies under the muscle belly of, of this, you know? So it's like, oh, I didn't even think of, to pay attention to look to see exactly what muscle belly that was. But looking at it beforehand, now you know when you go and look and somebody shows you this nerve, you're like, all right, well, what muscle belly is it in between? What is the function? So now you know kind of what to look for when you're being shown this type of information. Yeah. Oh, so much anatomy. I, I don't remember <laughs> Back in much the day. of that anymore. Back yeah. in the day. First class you ever take all those years oh, ago. Oh, man. So, so long uh, ago. And that's one that I find really difficult to teach in any kind of like using mnemonics and stuff way because it's just, there's so much rote memorization yeah. involved in, in the anatomy class anyway. What's actually clinically relevant is kind of cool, but yeah. getting past that course. Yes, yeah, it is hard, man. I know, you know, now there's some videos online where, you know, you have 3D models and there are things online mm-hmm. where you can like click and it like gets rid of the bones. So you just see the arteries or whatever it is. So there are some tools and things out there now, but it's still something you have to put in time to get and understand. Definitely. So with all of the feedback that you've received since your book's been released, are there any particular struggles that you've noticed that students have or any obstacles that maybe they need uh, advice on, on on overcoming? I think a lot of people tell me the way that they looked at um, study scheduling and the way that they looked at questions and, and step one prep, that those are big parts that helped them um, of of the book. You know, because a lot of people had issues. Of, oh, well, how do I study such information in, in this time? Like, I just need to be in the library for 10 hours every night. And I'm like, no, you don't need to be in the library for 10 hours every night. There's no, you know, just have a, a way that you can process information and, and have a set schedule, but not, but also not a set schedule because things happen. You'll never, you never always stick to your schedule 100% of the time. If there are people that do that, they don't exist. I don't believe it. There's somebody, there's no, there's no. no way you get your schedule 100% of the time. Things happen. And even just like in medicine, like, you know, things are going to come up when you're in med school. Things are going to come up when you're, when you're in residency. Like just exe- for example, today something came up. I had a plan. I was like, oh, I'm going to go home and I'm going to write this paper and 
and then at least get that done with. And then I came back and something on my AC was messed up. So I had to go to Home Depot and get some other things. So you never know what can happen. Things never always go as planned, but, you know, try to have some type of idea what you want to get accomplished. Yeah, rough draft, because otherwise you'll develop anxiety being too stringent with your schedule. Exactly. And then you feel like you have to overcompensate and it and then you get stressed (laughs) out and, you know, start losing bone, getting thin, and then you just never hear from me. <laughs> <laughs> Fall through the cracks. Cracks in the floor. <laughs> Crawl right through the cracks. All right. Um, so as we get closer to the end here, I usually like to do what I call a walk down memory lane. It's three rapid fire questions or can be rapid fire. Depends on how much you want to delve into them. All right. You ready to take a walk uh, with me? Let's do it. Let's, let's do it. Rapid fire. <laughs> All right. First one. Is there anything you wish you could remember better? Hmm could remember better it's an interesting that's interesting wording um i also have a lot of uh, memory champions and nemesis on here too so it's really funny to see what some of their answers can be on and off of uh recording <laughs> no i mean only nah, i'm trying to think like things that i can remember better i mean besides this basic anatomy and like you realize like once you're uh, in residency, there's just so much like there's just so much stuff that, that you have to learn and um, have to know. So if I could remember like all the 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 little details, like the this procedure has X percent outcome versus this one has this percent. It's like the small little percentages of you know different procedures and like the complication rates, like those little those small percentages if I can remember those better now granted I haven't put much time and effort into remembering all of those but you know if there's something I could choose it'd probably be like those little uh very detailed aspects um this sounds good when you, when you know them hmm. there's a lot of numbers there you should uh check one of my recently uh released podcast episodes about memorizing numbers yeah. just a basic introduction to it no, all know. right second question <laughs> Looking back now, is there anything that you would have changed about how you approached your schooling? Would not change anything, man. I, you know, I'm a prone of everything happens for a reason. You know, the the dominoes fell or, you know, everything aligned and it made me where I'm at today. So I probably wouldn't change anything. I think it all went perfectly fine. I enjoyed I enjoyed uh, med school. You know, I made it out alive. I was able to match into a residency and uh, I'm enjoying residency now, so I probably wouldn't change anything. Nice. Yeah, I mean, how hard was it? You, it sounds like you were barely ever there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but at the same time, like, if you just had the mindset of, you know, I'm just going to go for whatever I want to do, I'm just going to go for it. You know, that's kind of the mindset I had going into med school, which is why, you know, if there was something I want to start, I didn't let anything stop me. I kind of did it. Or like, you know, you have this idea, like, hey, I want to start this podcast, and you just went out and did it. You know, so now at least now when you're not like you're 70 years old and you're on your deathbed, you won't be saying, oh, I should have done that when I was a young whippersnapper in med school. I should have, <laughs> did, I, I should have done those things because then you can now say, well, I actually I did it and it went well or I attempted it and it didn't go well and I, I did something else. So I just say just continue yeah. to do what you want to do and don't wait. Better to try and fail than regret not trying at all. Exactly. All right. Third question. Is there anything that you wish you did differently in your career or side gig, like the podcast or being an author? Mm. Let's see. For my, for my podcast, it, there, would, but there would probably be something I, I would do differently. I'd try to, I would probably, it would have planned that a little bit more as far as um, reaching out to different guests and exactly which guests that I wanted. I, I I didn't adjust or I adjusted to residency, but I, um, you know, you have to kind of, I probably, I would say I probably wish I would have been better prepared to um, do a podcast and be in residency, you know, the type of podcast episodes that I was doing, you know, not I'm doing an orthopedic podcast now, but that's, that's something a little bit different. So I would say I would have, have planned a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, it can be pretty tricky, especially when you're reaching out to guests and no idea when or if they're going to respond. And yeah. Oh, there's a lot of planning goes into it. I've done a lot of, I've reached out to a lot of people. I mean, at the end of the day, at least you can say I reached out, I tried or, you know, I figured a way. You never know who you who will say yes. It'll be like the person that you think is going to say yes that never responds and then the person that you 
don't think that you think they're super busy would never respond be the first one to respond in five minutes and they said yes and so yeah you know. <laughs> unpredictable yeah all right are there any other resources you'd recommend for the students well um uh, of course uh not to my own horn but i'll recommend the med school survival kit which is the uh <laughs> which is a uh, the book that i published this on amazon you can get it. it has pretty good reviews uh if you do get it and it does help please leave a review even if it doesn't help, leave a review there too. You know, I don't, I don't always say leave a good review, just leave a review. Uh, other resources inside the Boars podcast are pretty good. Yours. Um, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, there's, nice. there are like specific resources for like, uh, you know, specific subject exams, but I think that might be going like a, very, a little in depth for the, for the question asked. Quite possibly. Yeah. <laughs> And they change so often, you know. They do. Uh, gotta new, gotta keep like it with the podcast. Things come, new things come out like every year that's better yeah. than, than the year before. At least with our podcast, we try to keep up with the times to some degree. Yeah. So true. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Wendell Cole, author of a medical school survival kit and convos with Cole podcast. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, Chase. Thanks for having me, man. I enjoyed it. Uh, um, I, I enjoyed it, man. Keep me in the loop, man. I, I'd love to see where this goes. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. I'd really like to thank all of you listeners who have subscribed to the show and rated it. Already, this show has made some major headway in the medical podcast charts. Within the first two episodes, we're in the top 100, and hopefully this will keep climbing. If you're inclined to do so, please head over to iTunes, find the show, and click to leave a review. You can also find the links on any of our social media pages, which can guide you. I also wanted to announce the Inside the Boards phone app. For those that have already subscribed to the Audio QBank through ITB, this will give you a much more intuitive manner to listen to all of the board exam audio questions, as well as have access to all the ITB podcast episodes. So head over to InsideTheBoards.com to purchase your Audio QBank subscription or download the app from the App Store.